It is Monday, January 9th, 2023. This is another edition of Baseball Today. That is my man, Trevor Plouffe. I am Chris Rose. Producer Dan is along for the ride as well. Uh, we moved it up a day. We normally go Tuesday, Thursday. This week, we're going Monday, Wednesday. A little bit of a scheduling snafu. Uh, it is the off season, so uh, we apologize if that has um, ruined anybody's start of the week, but hopefully we'll cover all the baseball topics that are truly necessary. Uh, Ploof, we start today with uh, with a little bit of somber news. Uh, Liam Hendricks, a fine closer for the Chicago White Sox, announced on social media that he is going to be starting treatment for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, he said he has gotten a very good prognosis from the doctor. Um, he feels confident. Uh, all we can do is send our wishes. He is one of the best personalities in baseball, in addition to being an outstanding closer on the south side of Chicago, and we just want to wish him well. Yeah, I've known Liam since he was a pup, and you guys know I love Cuban ball players. I also have an affinity for Australian ball players. We had a mm -hmm. lot of them with the Twins, and that's where I got to know Liam. So uh, you're right, great guy, great personality, good for the game of baseball. He turned himself into one of the best, if not the best, reliever in baseball. And we're wishing you well, Liam, um, from here at Baseball Today. Yes, uh, the Chicago White Sox said they won't have any update until probably around opening day. And uh, everybody here certainly respects that. Just know that you have a baseball community um, that is behind you, Liam Hendricks, and to his wife as they start out on their journey. We, um, we start today uh, talking about Trevor Bauer. The Dodgers made it official on Friday when they DFA'd him, which means that by Thursday they either have to release him or they could trade him before that. Um, is there any question that he will play somewhere in 2023? I, For the longest time, I've been pretty steadfast in saying he's going to pitch somewhere in 2023. And I think I'm still leaning that way. I'm probably like at 80% sure that he's still going to pitch somewhere. Now, it's going to be interesting to see you know, if one of these teams that needs a starting pitcher, particularly maybe in the American League, do they just call the Dodgers up and say, hey, instead of you releasing him and not getting any salary relief, we'll give you three million bucks, four million bucks, something like that to try to get him before he becomes a free agent and is able to negotiate uh, and go somewhere where, you know, he gets to choose. So uh, it's it's going to be interesting. To see, I, I, like I said, I believe he does pitch somewhere next year. I've given my teams on this show before um, on Talking Baseball. Spoiler alert. I said, I think the Rangers might be the front runner. And that's just straight up me thinking. I don't, I didn't hear uh -huh. that at all. And that's it. I think that I, he will pitch. He will pitch. And here's the deal. This is not as simple as any other transaction that'll happen, whether it's a trade or whether it's him being released and then signing via free agent. It's not very simple at all. In fact, it's extremely difficult. Uh, if and when he signs somewhere else, and we might get to this story somewhere over the next week, the owner has got to be there at the introductory press conference. It's inexcusable if ownership is not there, because this is going to be strictly your call. As fans, you can have whatever opinion you want about Trevor Bauer. There is a certain sector that'll say he was never criminally charged. He never did anything wrong. This, that, the other thing. There's another sector that'll say if Trevor Bauer was the last pitcher on earth, I wouldn't give him a job. I understand both positions. Ultimately, a team can put some fan bases in a very difficult spot. I can tell you this from being a Cleveland Browns fan. Very difficult spot. You have an affinity for a team. You have a love for a team that extends back to your childhood. You might not like Trevor Bauer if he ends up signing with your team or gets traded to your team. Are you supposed to give up your allegiance to your squad after several decades of fandom? Maybe you've created some amazing family memories because of it. You should not be forced to be put in that position by your team. The owner has got to step up say front and center San Diego Union Tribune reported this weekend the Padres are out they are the most in team of anybody out there they're throwing 300 million dollar contracts out there like they're candy go take them take them and they reportedly don't want anything to do with Trevor Bauer so to me this is all about an ownership call 
You are the only one that is saying yes to Trevor Bauer. A GM could walk into your office and say, hey, we can make a play for Trevor Bauer. You have two choices. You can either say, yep, I'm in, or you can say, hell no. You owe your explanation to your fan base. If he doesn't sign with a team before the season starts, you know, and, and it could be something like that where he is a midseason acquisition, whatever it may be, or, or be a free agent signing at that point. Uh, do you think he plays somewhere else to try to keep his skill level up? I know he has th- his warehouse that he, you know, plays in, and I'm sure mm-hmm. he's done plenty of live at bats in there, but do you go and get in a league somewhere? Whether it's overseas, mm-hmm. whether it's independent ball, like what? What do you do? You think he does something like that? Yes, because you. And I pitch. think he documents every bit of it. And it now, if this were me, if I were an owner of a team, if I were fortunate enough to be one of thirty, I would want nothing to do with him. He's an outstanding pitcher. He really is. He's really good, and he he understands the profession about as well as anybody. It seems like, right? I mean, he's always been a step ahead of everyone else. I still wouldn't want him. And you know what? There was an LA Times poll that half the fans wanted him and half the, I get that. I understand fans want to win. But boy, at the end of the day, you have to be able to put your head on the pillow. And I'm just telling you as somebody who's been kind of caught in the middle as a fan of somebody I didn't personally want on a team. It's hard. You are putting your fans in a difficult, difficult position. And some fans don't give a shit. They just don't care whether it's they they don't believe the accusations or overall they're just like, hey, I want to be entertained by a guy who can throw and move a baseball. It's your prerogative. I can't tell you that that's wrong. It's wrong for me. might not be wrong for you. Well, I hope we get, I hope we get clarity by Thursday. I hope, I hope that we kind of know what's going on at that time or else it's going to linger and we're going to have to keep talking vaguely about the situation because that's kind of what we have to do now. I mean, we don't know what's going to happen. We're just trying to piece it together. Well, we know he's not going to be a Dodger and we know not that several other teams have no interest in him. I think <clears throat> I'm still at the 80%. I think someone, someone picks him up. And I do. I agree. I agree. But like I said, this is on ownership. If ownership is not there at the introductory press conference, Whatever local media is there has got to say, where's your owner? Talk to the GM. Where's your owner? Doesn't your owner own owe an explanation to everybody here? Like they tiptoed around it when Bauer did his introductory press conference here with the Dodgers. They were like, well, you know, he's admitted some mistakes, which he never did. He never admitted mistakes. And yes, he did make them on social media. Don't give me that shit in the comments section about what rose what did he do plenty of places to go look it up plenty of places i'm not a fan and i don't care if he's a fan of mine or not I, i'll be honest with you i don't care he's very successful at pitching the rest of it i'm not a fan of I like this i know it's rose. uncomfortable for people i'm sorry it's, it's uncomfortable for people and, and and people will come back at me and say well what about your quarterback rose hey i didn't make the move that's what I'm saying is that you are putting your fan base in a very difficult position, very challenging. So think about it, owners. Not, not that you're listening, but I don't know. Let's move on to a big trade. Tigers and Phillies. Centerpiece is a two-time all-star. Gregory Soto. He is going from Motown to the city of brotherly love. So has Phillies pen gone from a consistent question mark in recent years to a trustworthy component of a World Series contender? I think it's somewhere in between. I know you hate that answer. I mean, they've made additions this off season. I think so far they brought in three dudes. It's Strom, uh, Kimbrel, and now Soto. That goes along with Sir Anthony Dominguez, who I'm super high on. I love watching that guy mm-hmm. throw the ball. And as long as he's healthy, he's going to be really good. Alvarado, we know Bellotti there, Brogdon. We saw those guys in the run. Um, <clears throat> I think that I'll have the same take that I usually do on bullpens. They're, it's a fluid situation. And what we're seeing right now on Fangraph's roster resource, it's probably not going to be the way it looks come September when the race gets tight. So I think it's evolving. They have a nice group here that they can string together. They can play matchups. They can they have guys that have 
um, save experience with Soto. He's not going to close games out right away for this team, but he could uh, at some point uh, during the year. So I, I like where they have. Can right I ask now. you a question? Sure. Why isn't he going to be the closer? I think he was closer by default ish in, in, in Detroit. I would agree with that. So I think that they'll give him a chance. I think they're going to have a hot hand type of mentality here. I don't think anyone's going to step in and just do it. I like Sir Anthony for that role, but again, we can use him differently in different high leverage situations. Um, yeah. It seems like Alvarado hasn't really been a, a close out the game type of guy for them. So maybe just a hot hand type of thing throughout the year. I mean, Kimbrell is the biggest wild card in all of this. Like, you know, maybe they tap into something. Maybe we find some velo back. You know, it's it, you never know. This it, it is a year by year case with relievers. It really is, man. That's why it's so. I always talk about the bullpens and, and, and being fluid because you could have a reliever, Chris. And this is there's 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 examples all throughout baseball every single year. Bad year last year comes back, figures something out. Finger pressure is different. The release point is different, and things change. It's that it changes that quickly. So. I like it. I like where they're at right now. They had 11 different guys get saves last year. It's a pretty big number. Yeah. Um, and I also like what Rob Thompson can do from that left side. I mean, you're talking about, is there another bullpen where there's two guys that throw hundred from the left side? I, I, I don't know. The one thing that worries me about Soto is his walk rate, right? Yes. You've heard me talk ad nauseum about walks out of the bullpen. I mean, it drives me nuts. He's got 74 walks total his last two seasons. That is a very, very high number. He was top 10 among relievers in walks a season ago. If you're going to be a consistent back end of the bullpen sort of dude, you can't be doing that, particularly in a division that's that daunting, right, with the Braves and the Mets. Just can't happen. But I do like the move. I like the I I I really love the off season that Dombrowski's put together. Yeah, he hasn't he hasn't held Pat. He understands they had some work to do to improve the roster, and he's trying to do that. As far as the the walk rate, I totally agree. That's that's a that's a team's worst nightmare. Late innings, free passes. You just you see it come back to bite you time and time again. And when you're playing defense behind a guy that's putting guys on base all the time, just puts pressure on you, and you start to think like, hey, like. Throw a strike, bro. You really start to think like though, like that, and you don't want to be that way playing defense in a major league baseball game. Yep. Interesting, but aggressive. This episode is brought to you by DraftKings Sportsbook. Look, the NFL playoff picture is locked in, and my go-to place for wild card round action is obviously DraftKings Sportsbook. It's the official sports betting partner of the NFL. And to kick off the road to Super Bowl 57, new customers can bet just five dollars and get 200 in free bets instantly. And we're adding something. It's called the no sweat bet. Each day of the wild card round this weekend, you place any NFL bet of your choice. And if it loses, you'll get a free bet back up to $10. So there's no sweat. And all you need to do is download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use code baseball today. New customers can bet $5 on the NFL and get 200 in free bets instantly. Only at DraftKings Sportsbook with code baseball today. Minimum age and eligibility restrictions apply. See show notes for details. Brian Reynolds, a lot of news on him. John Heyman reported that the Pirates have offered him a six-year, $75 million extension, which would be the richest in franchise history. There's also a bunch of reports that there's a multitude of teams out there that are interested in him. Dodgers, Yankees, Rangers, Marlins, Mariners, just to name a few. Um, so in your opinion, is Brian Reynolds a pirate by the trade deadline? And if not, where would the most fun place for him to land be? I think he is a pirate uh, at the trade deadline because I think they're looking to be overwhelmed with a package for this guy because they have time with him. They have, they can just keep him until somebody really is desperate for outfield help, which there are teams out there. But, you know, when you're in the off season right now, you can dream upon players. But once you get into the thick of a season – and somebody gets hurt or somebody's underperforming, then things become a little bit, you get a little more anxious about the situation. And then maybe you do cough up those prospects. So in my opinion, I think he is with the pirates. I know he's demanded a trade, which kind of changes things. Although the pirates said, it doesn't matter <laughs> what you say, right. basically. Um, so I think he will be unless something drastic happens and someone comes and gives the pirates what they want. 
I actually think he does get traded this year. You know, I don't expect the Pirates to get off to this rip roar and start. Uh, I hope for Pirates fan, you're interested past May, but I'm not hopeful. So I think at that point they'll say, you know what, let's let's strike now. You know, let's do it while he still has three, you know, two and a half years left of control, three pennant chases. Hopefully he has a really, really solid first half. Um, I think he does get traded. And to me, the most interesting point or place landing spot at this point, I would say is Seattle. Their their offseason has been strange, I would say. You know, they okay. did sign A.J. Pollock uh, yes. this o- over the weekend for one year and seven million. But we know Pollock's injury history. Um, you know, he's still at, he feels like an everyday ball player. I just don't know about the other corner position, right? Are we still going to wait on Jared Kelnick? Do we still want to play that game? Or are we just going to use him as a trade piece somewhere? Dylan Moore is a guy, in my opinion, that is much more effective when you're moving him around as a utility guy because he can play so many different positions and not as an everyday ball player. I know he probably doesn't want to hear that, but that's the way I would look at it at this point. So I think Seattle would be a great landing spot. We know they still have plenty of young talent that they can they can dish out um, that I would imagine that the Pirates would be interested in. I like that. I think Kalnick and Pollock will probably – platoon a little bit to start the year unless Pollock gets off to a really good start and they, they let him hit against righties. I think you can't give up on mm-hmm. Kelnick. I just mentioned this on talking baseball. The kid's 23 years old, man. Like we gotta, we gotta slow our roll on this guy and like, let him breathe a little. I bit. know we do. I know. Yeah. But don't you think that they are, they're at the position where they have to take the next step? Like, okay, we got into well, the playoffs. Tay Oscar for the there. You have Tay Oscar there for, for this year. Um, it's one of your corner spots. And then if you put two in these two guys, it's probably what they're thinking uh, of doing, which is, you know, we'll see. And Pollock on, in his own right. I mean, 800 OPS career. I didn't even know that. Mm-hmm. I was shocked when Jake read that um, stat this morning. So I'd like the move for him. And we talked about this also. I'll bring it to the baseball today, people. I mean, this guy had a player option for 13 mil in Chicago and decided to take the $5 million buyout, get seven from the Mariners. So he's losing a 1 million guarantee. There are some incentives to push it over, but this is a guy that was willing to leave that on the table to go to greener pastures. Essentially. He saw the fun they're having. He's going over there. So that's, it's kind of got to hurt a little bit. I think for the white Sox fans. Wait, and he saw the, the fun they're having. What do you mean? What do you mean? He saw the fun they're having in Seattle. So he was willing to take a million dollar hit. Yeah. I mean, what no. else, what else is there? It was Winning? a miscalculation on, it was a miscalculation on his part. I think you he think thought that, the $5 million buyout and I could get probably 10 million. So I'm going to make a couple million. And it was a miscalculation. It could, it could have been, it could have been, he thought he was going to get a multi-year deal or, or whatever. That's definitely part of it. But I mean, that was a nice chunk of change to, to give up just to, to kind of get out of that situation. Oh, yes. That's what I'm saying. And if you're not completely you know, with- sure, uh huh. I'm a Pollock fan. I yeah. I've always liked him. I dig him. I think he's a good ball player. In the beginning of his career, it was an injury question. I don't think that's the question as much with him anymore. He played uh, exclusively in the outfield last year. No DH days. I think he played 138 games. Like that's one of the biggest totals in his career at 34. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it's good. All right, uh, Fernando Tatis has been cleared to resume baseball activities. How confident are you that Tatis returns to the form we saw prior to his injuries and his suspension? I'm pretty confident that he's going to be a really good ball player. And he was spectacular when he burst onto the scene. You know, if he gets back to that level, I I sure hope so. Like that kind of baseball talent just doesn't dissolve. You know, I, I understand there's been some injuries. I understand there's been some steroid stuff. Um, how much those steroids were performance enhancing. I don't know. It depends if you believe him or not that he was taking it for a ringworm or whatever. So um, in my mind, I'm going to go and say that I'm just basing it on raw baseball talent and, and the eye test that we've seen this guy and what he can do to a baseball and on the baseball field. I just, that, that doesn't leave. So I do believe that he'll get back to form and it's going to be one of the more fascinating storylines of the 2023 season because We've forgotten about this guy and the Padres did a lot without him and they added a lot of people without him. And so, you know, like he is surrounded by veterans and very, very talented ball players. I think it's going to be really, really good for him. 
uh, to get back into that lineup and have so much help around him. I mean, you brought in, since he's been gone, you brought in Juan Soto and Xander Bogarts. It's pretty <laughs> incredible. So if he comes back and is who he was, I mean, San Diego is going to be an absolute problem. Okay, so just so everybody's up to date on his medical situation, he has had a shoulder surgery and two wrist surgeries, including the most recent one in October. He also cannot return to action until April 20th. So he's missing the first few weeks of the regular season at this point. His worst OPS in his three full seasons, and that includes the truncated season as well, 937. Mm. That is his worst OPS, Ploof. Do you know how many people would kill to have that be the best of yes. a 12 year career? And it's the worst of his three. He's a player, man. And like, again, I I'm, I'm really hoping the stuff that he got suspended for was a miscalculation and was just negligence uh, because I want to see this dude ball out like that again. You're saying as opposed to something that he was relying on for years yes. and didn't get caught till then. Yes. Yeah. And and I also think there's an emotional side of this too, right? I mean, you have to remember, he's a young kid still. He's young. And people will say, well, he's, what is he, 24 now or whatever he is? I think he's 23, isn't um, he? 23 still? Oh, he just turned 24. That's right. We saw him dancing on his birthday. How do we forget? Oh, right, 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 right. So he just turned 24. Um, We don't know how that's going to affect him. We just don't. And uh, it, he could have the fortitude where it doesn't impact him at all. He could go on the road 81 times a year and a guy who was seemingly one of the most popular players in the sport will now be the heel. And we'll see how he handles that for the first time in his career. Cause he was, he was a lovable road player. Yeah. People, people came to see, he was one of the people in baseball that you went to a park to see. Yeah. You know, there's not many of those that can draw crowds. I mean, Tatis was one of them. You had Otani, you probably got trout. You got some of these pitchers, but, Tatis was one of them for sure. And that's a good point about, you know, going from media darling face of baseball to you know, a guy that's going to get booed at different stadiums. It's going to, it is, it'll take a toll on him mentally, but I do believe he has enough veteran presence there. They'll help him out through that. I mean, they're, they're going to have to, I think Machado will definitely be a guy that is there for him. And uh, even Soto, who's, you know, I think more of a, a peer than a veteran, I think will be good for him. Yep. I would agree. Before we get out of here on the YouTube and the AMP side of things today on this Monday, um, Tucker Barnhart, lifelong Pacers fan, was at a Pacers game recently. And there was one of those little things like during a timeout where you get to shoot. Well, this guy had a good stroke. He had to hit a free throw, a three-pointer, and a half-court shot in 40 seconds. Well, you could tell instantly, like, this dude played. I don't know if it was high school, a little bit of college. He had a really good shot. So finally hits the free throw, takes a couple shots at the three-point, hits it, and then he has time to still hit the half-court shot, and boom, he nails that. And you're like, oh, my God, dude, just what did he win? Did he win a car? Did he win 50 grand? He won 500 bucks, <laughs> $500. Are you embarrassed for the Pacers organization? A, a little bit. I mean, can he throw a uh, Reggie Miller jersey in there as well? Like, what? $500. Well, he, get, he got a separate prize pack as well. What was in the prize pack? Some rubies and emeralds? Like, <laughs> $500 seems to me like... a hoodie. If you made a free throw, one out of three, you give a fan 500 bucks. But if you have to go free throw, three-pointer, and a half-court shot. Yeah, I mean, we see people make half-court shots at, like, college games and win free tuition. Yeah. Step it up, Pacers. Pacers. If they want a baseball today up. hoodie for your package, let us know. Up the ante a little, bro. Just a little like, bit. I think some dude at the beginning of the year for the Lakers uh hit a shot and it was like 75 grand. And then the next Yeah, well they they, they like out. add to the pot every time someone misses and then eventually when you hit, they go. I'm in. Can you shoot. That's fun. You shoot. Okay, so you know, right now, obviously, off of back surgery, not not going to be my thing. I will take on people in a half court shooting contest. Oh, I suck at shooting a basketball, but half court shots. When I was a manager of the basketball team, in my high school, that's what I used to practice. That's such a dad thing to be good at, too. Just like trick shot, half court shot, behind the back. 
Well, people who are listening probably don't remember George Carl. He was a really good NBA coach. Cavs, Sonics, a few other squads along the way. Uh, good, solid player in the NBA, ABA um, in the 70s. He used to take his players' money because he used to do over-the-head half-court shots, and he had mastered it. The guys didn't know when he went to a new team, so pop it over his head. That's it. You know what's sad about today's society, Chris? What's that, bro? Let's get into it a little bit. Every time I see a video on the internet about some guy like making a, a basket, some trick shot, I wonder if it's real or computer mm-hmm. generated. Right. Well, that's where we've gone. I can't trust anything anymore. I'll tell you what is real. My discussion with the recently retired Teddy Barrett, one of 10 umpires who um, said goodbye after a long tenure. He is the latest episode of the Rose Rotation, and your name came up. Yeah, Trevor was great as a player. Um, I loved him, and, and uh, so he named his he named his kid Teddy, right? Yeah, so, yeah, and um, so I don't. He, I always told him, I said, "You named your kid um, after me, just so you can get a break on some of these calls." But <laughs> um, uh, it's uh, Trevor. Trevor was awesome. Oh yeah, clip that for me, somebody. A little bit of love for you. That's cool. He was one of my favorites. And I liked a lot of different umpires. These guys are all good dudes. They love baseball. If you really talk to them, like they genuinely care. That's 95% of the dudes are awesome. Um, and and Ted was the top for me. Like my favorite umpire was Ted Barrett. Yeah, I mean, we covered a lot of ground here because umpires always have amazing stories. He worked the Sammy Sosa corked bat game. He's the only umpire to be behind the plate for two perfect games. He talked about how difficult it is when he knows that he's blown a call, what that process is. Um, You know, he talked about, I didn't know this, but all the umpires play sports together. They would always get together, play hoops and stuff. I was like, man, umpires making their own calls, pick up hoops. A game must take seven (laughs) hours. He they talk like, about like a family. They, they, uh, those guys travel together a lot and they're with each yeah. other a lot. Whatever oh, crew yeah. you're with, that is your family. Yeah. And, you know, in the off seasons, they had jobs, other jobs. So he, we talked a lot about that. We talked yeah. about his sparring days with Tyson, um, you know, as a boxing guy and what he wants to do now. It's kind of interesting what he wants his next step to be mm-hmm. now that he's retired from baseball. So go listen to that. Rose rotation is out. Uh, We are back on Wednesday. Once again, it will not be Thursday. It will be Wednesday. So we will see you then for our one-of-a-kind producer, Dan Rourke, and my man, Trevor Plouffe. I am Chris Rose. We'll see you next time here on Baseball Today.